Hey, it's Christine Horn, the Booking Magnet. Welcome back to another episode of Booking Magnet Magic. Today, you get to hear from my friend, Tawana Floyd. She's a producer, she's a writer, she's a performer, she's an editor. She's super funny, she works all the time. (laughs) She's a fellow Boogie Down Bronx native, just like me. And I mean, truly, she is one of these people, souls, who when you just, when you meet her, just the energy is good. The vibe is just good. I met her when I moved here to Los Angeles and seeing her at auditions and meeting her through multiple people. And it was really an honor and a treat to sit and chat with Tawana. You're gonna notice this interview went a bit longer than some of the others because we was just in the zone. Okay, so you might need to take this as a two-parter, you know, depending how busy you are, but curl up and enjoy getting to know Tawana Floyd. Tawana! I, you know, I got to sing for everybody. Yes! <laughs> you know if I'm going in the right direction. You are here. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me here. I'm happy to be here. I've been excited all week to talk to you. Oh, yay. I'm, and, you know, because of pandemic life and things, we don't see each other and we don't go no. into person auditions anymore like that. No. So we see each other quite often in L.A. Yeah. But now it's, you know, on these Instagram, Facebook streets. Exactly. Right. That's the current events. Right. <laughs> what do you mean you're not on Instagram? I need to see what you're doing. <laughs> How am I supposed to? I'm supposed to know. You had three. You had a kid. (laughs) Oh my gosh! I'm so happy to see you, y'all. But if you have missed any part of the Booking Magnet Magic series, make sure you catch up. Today we're talking to Tawana, and I got I got to know Tawana just by being in LA and truly the 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 circle of black actresses, you know. Who have good energy i'm gonna say that who have good energy is mm-hmm. small and you, you just start to attract each other mm-hmm. and you recognize her i'm sure from all the things she's always on your on your tv in yeah. some weird way <laughs> um so how did how did all this start i mean we share a but we share mm-hmm. a, we share a new york connection yes bronx girls <laughs> who who migrated out who, who was part yeah. of the great exodus <laughs> When the buildings were burning me, down. Tell me about that. What was that like growing up in New York for you? And, and how did that Man. get, how did you start into the world of of, of, of acting and being a mm-hmm. creative? Yeah, um, I was born and raised in, well, I was born in the South Bronx. And so I think the best depiction of what the South Bronx looked like at that time is the get down on Netflix. I think yes. Boz Marman did and a great, uh, mm-hmm. a great job at showing us what that looked like. And so I'd say maybe around 77, there was this exodus of the people who could afford to move their families out, started moving out of the South Bronx and started migrating north. Um, I know some friends who moved to the North Bronx. We moved to Yonkers, which I've recently found out that the Bronx is Yonkers. It was just some dude named Bronx brought up that (laughs) section and called it the Bronx. (laughs) But yeah. Very interesting. My grandma lives not too far from Yonkers still. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly where I was. Where I was living last before I moved to to LA, and so I was right at the height of 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 hip hop starting. So really, hip hop raised me. That is, it, I don't think there's anything that can show what a phoenix rising is than watching something being birthed out of burnt down buildings and bricks and rubble or whatever to come full circle to be where it is today when everybody denounced it everybody said this is not going far we hate this uh you know whatever but these black and brown kids created this thing and now it drives the culture of everything so for me to witness that and also be a part of it because when when you're during that time, everybody had to choose like a hip hop discipline. You had to either be a B girl or you had to be an MC or a DJ or a graffiti artist. Well, I was like seven, so I had to be. <laughs> I got to choose right now. Right, hey, I, I can't do. I can't do graffiti. Um, I'm really not good with rhyming. Maybe if I put my head to it, I'm a little lazy. So I just started <laughs> dancing. <laughs> And, and I think what really was the impetus is because I was watching these shows and these young kids, Beat Street and all that stuff, but also um, being the one kid at the parties with all my cousins, 
I was the best dancer. And so once, but I was also very shy. So my, my family would pay me to dance. So once I learned that I could earn a couple of dollars, well, actually like 50 cent, <laughs> five dollars was like a big come up, right? <laughs> but yeah, so, so that's really how I started. And then, you know, we moved a lot, but I did go to um, a performing arts high school in Yonkers for dance because, and I'm such a late bloomer. I, I just, God got me because everything is really like happenstance, but really is divine, divinely ordered. In junior high school, I did not know that we had to choose a high school. I was just used to just being told what to do. Mm-hmm. And my friends were like, oh, what high school are you going to go to? And I was like, I don't know. Where, where do we go next? And he's like, no, Twani, you got to choose. And I was like, what? So there was like a trade school. There was um, a computer school. And then there was a performing arts school. And I found out, grace of God. I didn't know there was a performing arts school in Yonkers. It happened in 84. Four, I believe, 83 or 84. And what they did was they started integrating the schools. So I went to a school that I was bust into the white neighborhood in the 80s, like oh, civil rights all over again. Gotcha, gotcha. So I chose the performing arts school because I watched fame as a kid. You know, mm-hmm. fame has birthed a lot of little creatives from that age range to teach us to, to make us want to dance or sing or whatever the case, play music, instruments, whatever. So mm-hmm. that was like really the fortifying moment for me of recognizing dance was really a part of what I do. We moved to New Jersey during, I think, my junior year of high school, which was like the, at first it was horrible, but then of course I made friends. And then my parents moved back a year before I graduated high school. And I'm and I'm like, I called my best friend. I was like, where did y'all go for your senior trip? And she said, oh, we're we going on a dude ranch. And I was like, oh yeah, we're going to the Bahamas. So I'm going to have to find somebody to stay. <laughs> like, I had that. Yeah, a do range? No, we're going to the Bahamas. So I wound up staying with a friend and then at the end of high school, uh, moved back to the Bronx because that's where my parents were at that point. So my one friend, Cheryl Sidnor, shout out to her if she's ever watching this. We went to that performing arts high school together. And at that time she was working for Def Jam had a an at Def Media. They had an advertising marketing company at that time. And she worked for them and she was like, hey, they got this audition. LL Cool J's trying to make his comeback and we should go down there. And I'm like, all right. I, I mean, I had no, no dreams. I, I really didn't know what was next, right? I, I don't know. I was just like a kid on the block, just like hanging out. I really had no vision. And so we go to this audition. Now, me being the dancer that we were when we were in school, we would change into leotards and, and perform so that you can move. So I get to the school. I get to the audition. I go in the bathroom. I skip down. I come out with, with my, I went, of course, I went and got an outfit because you know you always got to be fly in New York. Of course. I went and got some orange little, little biker shorts and a little crop top and, and whatever. And I came out of the bathroom. My two friends are looking at me like, Come and tell us. And I was like, we all went to the same school. Why do I need? I didn't know I needed to tell you. I just assumed that we're on the same wavelength. I didn't. I'm just having this. Wow. This realization now that. Oh, my goodness. We're not on all, uh, all on the same wavelength. Wow. Anyway, so do the audition uh, is a mad girls there. I don't know what competition is. I'm just sitting there having fun and doing my thing. I think I'm a bad bitch because yeah. that's, that's how we are in New York, right? In New York, we braggadocious. It's like, I, I'm, I'm dope too. So, <laughs> so I do the audition. It got down to maybe like 20 girls in the room. And then they was like, we, okay, we don't know how to eliminate. If, if you could do a split, just do a split. So you just heard boom, 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 boom around the room. I was one of them. And so I wound up being in the LL Cool J's Around the Way Girl. That was my first... Yeah, I gotta go back and watch. <laughs> I gotta go back and watch. It was interesting because I didn't know what to do. There's one point where LL, they're filming. I don't know the camera is. He puts his <laughs> arm around me. He brings me to the front. I trip over his feet. It's it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness there is uh, an actual photo that I think was in Word Up magazine that I could be like, I really was there. So, so, but that, what that did was that led to, there was this woman, Meredith, I can't remember her last name. And she was always like a scout, scouting out little young kids or club kids to go and do other music videos. And so that's how I would do music videos around town. Now I want to say all the connective people were in Brooklyn and I was way in the Bronx. So I didn't have that network 
I didn't know that you had to do that back then. And um, uh, Meredith would always, when she see me, she'd be like, oh, can you give me a headshot? When you get a chance, get a headshot. And I'm like, what is that? What is that? And I'm like, well, she keep calling me. So I don't, I don't need a headshot. And then she stopped calling. <laughs> you can get it a headshot. I didn't get a headshot. I didn't know. <laughs> right. And then I finally, finally started to work that out. So that was how, that was my, 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 my um, journey into entertainment was through being a B-girl, choreographing and choreographing and dancing choreographed um, dance routines and music videos. And then later, of course, by happenstance, somebody in Yonkers is like, hey, you know, my friend, he's coming up. He needs a, he needs some dancers. Can you choreograph? I'm like, yeah, sure. And it was DMX. Now, DMX, they never need no dancers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you know, his, he, was known, he was not known for his dancers. He he was no, he never needed dancers. He even he even said he's like, Y'all know I don't need dancers, right? And we're like, Yeah, we know. He said, But I like y'all. His then manager was trying to make him MC Hammer. It was a whole thing. But yeah, right. so so that was it. And I'll tell you the the defining moment of when I had to stop dancing was when I saw Michael Jackson's Remember the Time, and there was nothing but New York dancers in that video. And I sat there and I cried, like, how come I wasn't there? How come I didn't know about it? Whatever. So that defining moment was not only just um, uh, a me pulling out of dance, but later on, in retrospect, I realized the importance of networking. I didn't know how to do that then. So then I was like, I don't want to dance anyway. And, and there's a ceiling. So what else can I do? So I started to transition into acting because when I was in seventh grade, my choir teacher put me in Pippin because I had a lot of energy and I got on her nerves. So she, would, <laughs> so she wanted me to be in this so I could dispel that energy and I right. loved it. So I remember that and I said, well, I'm gonna learn how to do that. And I just kind of like found my way around New York trying to find classes to learn how to act. And here's the arrogant part of me, because when I went to that Performing Hearts High School in Yonkers, each department would talk about dance is the hardest discipline. It's harder than learning an instrument. It's harder than acting. And then the acting teacher's like, acting's the hardest. It's harder than dancing and so on and so forth. So I came into acting with this arrogance. I'm like, oh, it's acting. It's, it's easy. I can, I'm a dancer. <laughs> and, and then I had this audition for Men in Black, I think it was Men in Black 2. First of all, how'd I get that audition? Second of all, I was so bad that at one point, the casting director looked over her glasses like- Not that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a who let you in here moment. That's exactly what that was. And in that moment, I said, I think I need to take classes. <laughs> I think I need to- This isn't transit. No, mm, I'm a no. But, but it's discipline. I have discipline. <laughs> I can hit a mark. They're like it's a different discipline. Oh, oh, beats. I know beats. No, <laughs> not okay. Yeah. So, so that was my trajectory into becoming an actor, and um, then I, I was at the School for Film and Television, which is, I believe, now it's gone, but it was in New York, and I was learning commercials because I've always loved commercials. And then I also found out, you know, how much money people made, and I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And I was taking this class. Of course, I was horrible. And there was this one guy who was really good. And I spoke to him afterwards and, you know, was trying to understand his journey. And he was like a political science master's degree or whatever. He's like, but I always wanted to act. And he said, he looked in backstage for those who don't know backstage is this periodical. It used to be a paper that we got. It's a paper every, I think, Wednesday. That's right. Now, it's an app now. It's online now, but it still but if has. You can get that paper from the from the newsstand. Scout which, where where am I going to focused? Gonna yes. Today? Make your plan. Make your plan. Get your little eight by tens and your yeah. envelopes. Open calls. So yeah, so he had found this Meisner teacher, and he's like, yeah, I've been going to her, and, and it's been made all the difference. So I found her, and I went to her, and I was there for for two plus years learning Meisner. Um, in that studio with that woman. And that was, she, she was, she was a lot. She was very demanding, but her need for the truth is what she instilled in all of the actors. 
Mm. So, so that was really where I learned how to act. That's where I became great, but still had this inadequate cloud over me. It's like, oh, but I didn't go to Yale. Oh, but I didn't go blah, 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 blah. I just did this because in New York City, <clears throat> you, surrounded by the and the Yale. you are surrounded by it. And there's this snobbery that really yeah. that's the best and everything else is a par. So for many, many years I had, I had, and it still comes up where it's just like, oh, I didn't go to, oh, I didn't do that. I should have. And at one point I, w- I considered going to, to Yale and I was fortunate because that acting teacher had a really good friend who was, a, um, what was she? She was a career coach, but they were both, they both went to university together as, and to train as actors. And so she brought her in to work with us. And that woman had seen me act and I was telling her how I was feeling and I was going to go to, you know, to Yale. And she said, I think you are really being hard on yourself. I've seen you act. If you go to Yale, it's going to cost you this money. It's going to do all these things. You already have the foundation. Now just go to Yale, go to their website, look at the classes that they offer and make your own curriculum. And it'll save you much more money. And plus you get to choose the teachers that you want to work with as opposed to being beholden to working with these people that who knows what could be going on. And so that's what I did. And so everybody who knows me well knows I'm, it was great advice. I'm constantly training. I'm constantly elevating my skills and looking for ways to, at first for, for, for many years, I would call it how to be a better actor. But recently during the pandemic, I realized what I've been learning is how to be a better storyteller. How do I, how do I break down the story? And so it's just like this evolution because we're always growing in our artistry. Um, But yeah, that's how I got here. I love it. But so how did it get you to LA? Mm Because now you're you're taking your, you made your own curriculum. You're taking your classes. You're doing some good, some bad auditions. How did, how did LA happen? So LA happened, I met this guy uh, at Nell's. He was a bouncer at Nell's. So Nell's was was like the hot spot in New York City. It was this kind of like this lounge, but also it had a dance floor underneath. It had special nights for certain types of music. It was the place where if you were a club kid and you like to dance, that's the place where we would go. And so I met this guy there and it's like, I walked, I walked up and he was so gorgeous. Like I was like, he looked like a skinny Luther Vandross. Like he is fine. (laughs) But I've always been really shy. And so my friend let him know that, that I was interested in him. I went in, I'm dancing, whatever. I come out, my hair stuck to my face or whatever. And he's like, oh, so I hear that, that you think I'm cute. And I was just like, "Ah," like looking like a little preacher that came from out the sewer. And, but yeah, so we had started to date and he told me on the first night that his plan was to go to law school. He had always wanted to go to law school. And if we were going to get serious, that he wanted me to know that at some point he's either going to go to Michigan or California to study law. And I, ambition? Yes, I'm, I'm here for it. So we dated for, I think, three years. And then he finally went to uh, Thomas Cooley Law School in Michigan. And while he was gone, as I think he was there for three years. So that year when he was about to come back, I realized damn, he went and followed his dream. What what are you going to do? Now he's going to come back. What are you going to get married, have kids? Whoa, I'm not ready to do that yet. I'm still like young. So it was like all this panic that was happening. And so we did, we moved in together. And it, and I think with, I think we moved in for like maybe a year or maybe eight months. Yeah. It was like eight, seven or eight months. And we realized this is not going to work. And so it was kind of perfect. God, God ordered, divinely ordered. I have this friend who was from Co-op City in the Bronx and she had been here in LA for 10 years and she was always like, you need to move out here. I need friends out here. You need to move out here. And I'm like, girl, I ain't coming to LA. I'm gonna do in LA. And so finally I was like, um, I think I'm gonna go to LA. So I just hashed out this plan because I had this career coach and I had my, my three month plan, my one year plan planned out. Then my three month and all this other stuff and then one day we were talking, I was talking to her and she said, you just need to come to LA. And I said, okay. And she got quiet. She's like, stop playing. 
like, Swan, are you always playing? I was like, no, I'm going to come. You know, we broke up. I moved out. I didn't follow my dream. And now is the time. I'm trained. I'm ready. And so that was a transition. But it, there was like, I call it a trifecta. I don't even call it that. I don't know if I call it a trifecta, but a trinity, a trinity of events. Because first, what, what happened first? First, I had to put my cat down. This is when I'm living with this guy. My cat, I love my cat. She got really sick. So I had to put her down. So that's one responsibility that's gone. Mm-hmm. Then I was working at Bergdorf Goodman, making ridiculous money. And I had planned to leave because I was already starting to audition and book non-union commercials in New York. So I had planned to leave because it was getting really hard for me to make those auditions on my lunch break, all the stress that, it, you know what you know what I'm talking about. So I had paid off all my debt and then I was putting like several hundred dollars away a week. And then I was like, oh, I'm banking mad money. I ain't quitting. And then I got fired. <laughs> Woo. Come on, why? come on and help me out. When you, when you were, when you start teetering, like, oh, let me help no. you out. God said, we had a plan. <laughs> now you think this little money? No, no, no. You fired. You ain't seen nothing yet, boo. You, you fired. And I remember being in the HR office doing my final, whatever. There was two things that happened that day. And I'm talking to the HR woman and she's telling, giving me all the paperwork or whatever. And I'm just listening and she gets quiet and she stares at me and she's like, are, are you okay? And I say, yeah, why? She said, usually when people get fired, they're usually really upset and crying. And so I'm concerned that you're going to hurt yourself. I said, oh, can I collect unemployment? Right. She said, yeah. I said, no, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm good. This was long coming. And she's like, oh, okay. And as I'm walking back to us, well, I'm walking to the subway and I'm with the manager who had walked me over to HR. And she's like, she was like the junior manager. She was annoying. And she's like, oh, so, so what are you going to do now? I'm like, you know, you're going to go to like Saks or something. And I said, no, I'm going to pursue my acting. She's like, good luck with that. And walked off. And I was like, wow. Mm. She don't even know. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes that little battery in your back of, I don't believe you could do it. Mm-hmm. You know, so that was the second thing. And then me and him, we broke up. So I was like, that's three things that was holding me here. Major things. Major events. And so now I'm free to go and move. And so I'm, um, after he and I broke up, I moved into an apartment in Jersey City. Because he was from Jersey City. So we lived there because one, it was cheaper to the the lifestyle, but also it it was much faster, the commute to New York than it was when I was in the North Bronx. And so I moved into a tiny little apartment. And what was so interesting, although I was so close to my family in New York, I was still so far because I didn't have a car. And so I was in that tiny little apartment for a year, which became my sanctuary in this isolation and dealing with the despair and the breakup and all this other stuff. And so it was really helpful for me to have that time because when I moved here to LA, I didn't feel the loneliness that people feel when they make that transition from, from their family or whatever. I had already experienced that. Yeah. Yeah. Divine, divine order, nothing but divine order. And so, yeah, I I came up with a plan. I was working at an optical shop on weekends and booking my little non-union commercials and it was perfect. And my friend, uh, she was like, well, you know, you come to LA, you're gonna have to get a job. And I was like, no, I'm not. Maybe, maybe, maybe at first for a couple of months, but I'm not gonna be on no job anymore. Because once I got free, once Bergdorf Goodney terminated me, it was, it was the first day of spring. And I went and I sat in Washington Square Park and I had my Essence magazine and I heard the birds chirping. And it was as if God just turned the volume up on nature because I wasn't hearing them before, right? And so it was just a moment where I just looked up and had this realization and just saw the beauty, like my scope opened up. I heard the birds chirping. I'm sitting in the park. The first day of spring in New York is a major thing because we've been dealing with winter months, you know, for so long. So that first day, it's like, it's like the whiz when they take (laughs) off, (laughs) they take off that heavy thing. And I had this realization of I'm free. And then I went to um, the subway one morning and I'm just watching the rat race 
And I'm just watching people go get into work, hurried, head down, just not paying attention. And I was like, that was me. I was just trying to get to my destination, but not taking anything in. And so once I had that freedom and then moving here and LA is free, LA is about the consciousness here is about work hard, play harder. Mm -hmm. So it was a perfect fit for me to transition from that into here, LA. And, um, and it wasn't easy. Because culture shock and all these other elements, just trying to survive, you know, have a job and everything, all of that stuff comes into play. But um, it's here is where I I would say I found myself. That apartment in Jersey City was the was the beginning of that. But then coming to LA is where I cultivated who Tawana really is. And like when I go home, people don't recognize me. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you're different. Why do you drive so slow? Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of to be right. Yeah. Ease and flow. Yeah. Why, and, why, yeah, mock I, the horn. I, Relax. <laughs> don't don't touch my horn. And we should evolve, you know, as human beings. Yes. As we grow and as we go through stuff. And yeah, you know, I should I should not be the same. Yeah, I, same. I didn't have that language then. I I was just yeah. like, oh. I don't know. Oh, am I changing? Because, you know, uh, people fault you when you when you start to change. Oh, and absolutely. It, I, and, you know, and so it wasn't until probably probably the last eight years where now it's in the atmosphere where now we're hearing uh, celebrities and magnets of businesses talk about you can't stay the same if you're wanting to evolve. And yeah. so now I'm like, oh, OK, it's OK that I change. OK, good. Yeah. I love that. What a what a journey. And <laughs> what I what I'm the part of, your, of this whole story that that I'm locked into at this moment is I'm seeing you in this the, in the Jersey City apartment alone processing all the things. It was almost like it was like that preparation before you came here because like you said it is a culture shock. It is it is an adjustment. So mm-hmm. getting to know yourself a lot more being in your own space, mm-hmm. I'm sure proved very helpful when you came out here and, and yeah. lear- like you said, learning a new part of you, mm. exploring everything that's, everything is new, including everything. you. There were two people that are here now that were part of my transition in New York. And one is Crystal Lee Brown. We were doing this play in Harlem. Oh gosh. Um, I don't even want to talk about that experience, but that's how we met. Okay. And immediately our spirits connected. Um, and Chris, and then we, and for, those of you, for those of you watching and listening, Crystal Lee Brown is also part of this Booking Magnet Magic series. So if you missed her interview, make sure you catch it. Yes, check out Crystal Lee Brown. And she was just like this little sister. But when we found out we were moving to LA, that's when we really was like, oh, we need to stay in touch. And so, and I don't know if you know Anthony Bertram. Do you know Anthony Bertram? Yes, I actually okay. do. Yeah, I met I've met him through the Cool People Pod. Yes. Now he he probably does not know this, but when I I met him at the School for Film and Television and we have remained friends ever since then, but when I was having that breakup and when I moved into that apartment and me and him were broke back mountain, man, he he was living in Queens, he's from Queens, and he called me. He's like, "Hey, how's the move going?" And I was like, "It's done. I just got my bed on the floor and now I'm here. And he must've heard something in my voice. And he said, well, I don't really have money for the toll, but if you want to split the toll with me, I'll come and I'll come over. And I said, yeah, yeah. I think the toll was like $7. Like that's how, that's how tight it was. I, I was like, yeah, I got three fifty. you know, whatever. Not only did he come over, but he bought chicken wings and French fries. Oh. And, and anybody from New York who knows chicken wings and French fries, is it that is an act of endearment yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. for us to split and he had like a three dollar bottle of wine and we sat on my floor oh, i'm getting close to think about it we sat oh, on that friend. floor and look and at y'all now i know that's still my homie both of those people are still my homies anthony's dad made some banging food let me tell you <laughs> something i got a crush on pops i have this running joke with him i was like your dad's still married <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> I it was one Thanksgiving we shared. I was he was I think we we're at our friend Keenan's house, and I was like, that food was so good. I was like, yeah. this is so back to New York. I love apartment. that though. That's the you know for those of you watching and listening, the power of community 
and, and, mm. and friendship. Like it's not about having a huge circle. It's about yeah. who's in that, that quality over the quantity. Yes. Oh, I love that. And all the people we're mentioning are consistently working actors. Yeah. yeah. And so mm-hmm. I love hearing this story. I did, this is a new story to me too. So I'm <laughs> like, hmm, tell me more. What happened? <laughs> Oh gosh, yes. I love it. Let's, I'm going to transition to the things that sparked you. I hear how hip hop inspired yeah. you, and is and if you if you meet Tawana like in person, she just that's the, that's the vibe you're gonna get. You're gonna oh, you, cool. You, you ooze the hip hop. Oh you girl, do. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, yes. Which always makes you feel like home too. Yeah. Um, but when were you were watching when you were younger, and you would watch. TV shows or movies, like what kind of people drew you in? Like what, who were the performers Mm. that made you lean in and like really pay attention? Yeah. So, so, you know, we're talking about seventies, eighties, right. And so we weren't heavily meaning black folks, black people, we weren't heavily represented in television, but for those few episodes or shows that we did have, of course we had the Jeffersons, um, Marla Gibbs, Mm-hmm. is is like my spirit animal um <laughs> wheezy jefferson sherman yeah. hemsley you know roxy roker um of course there was good times but i was really more because i like i like luxury i don't know where that came from maybe my mother she's a libra we like she likes beautiful things but i've always mm-hmm. liked luxurious things even if i'm on a budget i'm going to find something luxurious to yeah. to splurge or indulge in so it's really the jeffersons but when i think of um like the sophisticated ladies, that Lola Falana. Yes. Woo! She was up there with those lashes and just beautiful in these outfits. So Lola Falana for sure. Um, Flip Wilson. I didn't realize this until recently, but that's really the core of where, uh, like, like when people's like, oh, who's your comedy favorite? And they name all these white dudes and white women or whatever. And yeah, that, you know, we give them accolades. But for me, it was Flip Wilson. And then come mm-hmm. to find out later, he owned his entire show. So wow. how powerful was he at that time? And being able to bring Richard Pryor onto the scene in this way that would help to elevate his star. So Flip Wilson playing Gertrude and having all those Black people, you know, doing these skits because we're funny. We're very mm-hmm. funny people. Um, without a script. Uh, <clears throat> I, um, I named my best friend when she started doing comedy and she needed a stage name. I said, you should call yourself Kizzy. And she was like, Kizzy, like the slave. And I said, yeah, she was strong. She was like the person who was like the liaison of making sure everybody was okay. Mm-hmm. And so Leslie Uggams, mm-hmm. love me some Leslie Uggams. And, oh my God, there's so many women. I'm trying to think of the woman who, Madge Sinclair, who used to be on, I think it was Trapper John MD. (laughs) You know, I'm looking. And and as you're watching them, but what, as you, outside of the representation Mm -hmm. and their, and I'm sure they're amazing, like you talk about the presence on the screen and the power, was it like, everybody has a sparkle or something like what? I what, exactly. what was that? Yeah. What did it feel like to you? When they you were regal, like, mm, which, you know. which goes with the luxuriousness that you enjoy. Yeah, yeah. They they would present. You know, you think of James Earl Jones. They they come on the screen or they walk into a room and they command attention, not in a way mm-hmm. that's egoic. That's saying, "Look at me." It's just like I belong here. Yeah. I'm taking up space, and I have something to say, and I'm going to say it. Mm-hmm. And and so it's just something that I've always been attracted to, power, and reverence, yeah. and anything that just feels like mat majestic. I, yeah. I yeah. So so those things will always draw me in. Like you know Felicia Rashad. That was I have a headshot where I'm trying to look like her <laughs> in the ninety. <laughs> you know this poise, this yeah. elegance. Cicely Tyson. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. That's so, true. and when you said Madge Sinclair, I was recently going back, back and looking at some of her older stuff recently. Mm. For some reason, I just I've been doing that a lot in yeah. my, in the past two years, especially since I've gone deeper into coaching. Mm-hmm. And 
I watched so much stuff like you when I was younger, but I'm like, I want to go back now with this more informed actor brain of mine. I want to see what they was really doing. I was just enjoying Listen. it to enjoy it. But I now I'm watching I'm like, oh, that was juicy. Oh, and I'm like taking notes. Like that is my yes. acting class these days. That's, that is the acting class. Oh, um, Ruby D. Oh, oh, yes. This woman is just, une- everything is unexpected. Where is she living? <laughs> you know? <laughs> When she did that clap in the, sorry if that hit, hurt my mic, but when she did that clap in, what was it? Uh, uh, not do the right thing. It was- um, Jungle Fever? No, no. Uh, Jungle Fever? No, no, no. Yeah, with Jungle Sam Fever. Jackson. Yeah, with Sam, yeah with Sam Jackson. When she was calling in his spirit in that kitchen, I'm getting chills every time I see that. Whew, that and, and then I watched something with her and Sidney Poitier many, many years ago. And I was like, oh, so she was always- doing this yeah you gonna make me have a ruby d playlist that's what i need i think she's a sagittarius too you might want to look her up she She might be let me see (laughs) i gotta gotta look at people's astro i'm like what's this sign i'm feeling like a leo but you know but yes this woman that woman whoo when she stare at you oh yeah yeah you yeah, gonna make me make. I I need a fresh playlist. I get so inspired. Just yeah, same. And I think and I think too. We, I think about how the industry is now and the opportunities we have now and the access we have now. And then I think about man, you these women and I'm and I'm just leaning toward the women, these black women same. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Like the barriers they had to break through to even to be able to, for us to be able to even talk about them now. Like yeah, like how. And how just how important that was and how important it is now the work we're doing yeah and it just it just man and I love just watching just how the watching how the weight of that time was on them in that moment mm-hmm. because we're all we're living through a different time in this moment we're going through different things and that's yeah. some of the that's some of the weight we bring to our performances based mm-hmm. in our life and history so just ooh, yeah. If I can add one more because because we yeah. are talking we're talking about mostly women, but it, he he poked his head through as I was thinking about it, and I almost forgot to um to, to mention him. Um, my grandmother loved the Rat Pack, and so you know she loves some Dean Martin. I love Dean Martin too, but that Sammy Davis Jr. Mm-hmm. was boundless in his creativity, mm-hmm. and I would watch him. I didn't have the language at that time, but I knew I was trying to figure out how is he able to be in this white world? It seems like it's seamless. The appearances seem like it's seamless. I know it wasn't, but I was wondering how is he able? And, you know, recently I went back and I started watching things and I'm like, they were always clowning him. There was always like some little, very subtle Mm -hmm. insidious jabs on his blackness. And, you know, he knew how to just laugh it off and keep it moving. But yeah, that's another phenomenal talent who came out of nothing. Yeah. Ooh, and made made true. himself the person that he is today. Or that is not so he's true. deceased, but yeah. Hey, what's up? It's Christine Horn, The Booking Magnet. I am so excited to invite you to our next event. It is called Booking Magnet Live. It's happening in Atlanta, Georgia on July 15th and 16th, 2022. You're gonna spend two days surrounded with actors just like you. Actors who want more, actors who are looking for a safe space, a sanctuary, a safe haven to express themselves, to learn, to grow, and to connect. So I'm excited for you to experience that. Make sure you join us July 15th and 16th. You can click the link below, and I'm so excited to see you there. Switch gears a bit. Mm Mm-hmm. Thinking about we as you watched all those people we mentioned and what drew you to them, they all had something magnetic that drew you in, something that was magical. What does Tawana know for sure makes her magnetic? No oh, one my, has to tell you. Yeah, my authenticity. Mm. I have a God-given gift to see subtext. And I'm not just talking about in a script. I'm talking about when I'm with people. Mm-hmm. It's a curse and it's a gift because once I see 
just the other day, my friend, um, she divorced at the top of the pandemic. And so now she's back on the dating scene and it's a riot. And so she's, you know, trying, practicing, she's practicing dating. And she's going back and forth on a lot of dating uh, uh, apps. And so this one, so I'm driving and she's telling me about this one guy she had a date with, blah, blah, whatever. She shows me, I was like, oh yeah, he looks kind of whatever. I was like, oh, I like the fact that he just wanted to meet you outside and just have coffee as opposed to like go to a bar at night, but you know, whatever. And then she pulls up this other guy. She's like, oh, this guy just liked me. And she shows me the picture. And I said, no. And then I went back to driving and she was like, what? I was like, no, his, his energy is dark. And she's like, how, how can you tell that? I was like, I don't, I can't explain it to you. Yeah. And, and I've been this person for a very long time because one of my other friends from New York, every time she had, she, she always had new friends. And every time I was like, that's not your friend this person, whatever. And then I would remove myself and she'd go, you know, hang out with those people. And then they would, you know, betray her at some time. And she would always say, how do you know that? And I said, you know what? It's almost as if I see their eyes turn black. It's almost like when you're watching a movie and their eyes complete, I I can't explain it. So I have this God-given gift that I'm really tapping into and allowing more so now um, in my, as I'm, as I'm getting older and and my becoming more wise and not afraid of it um that is the one thing that is a gift that i believe and it could also be um looks like my mic is hot it could also be being from new york and having to be safe yeah so having to read people people quickly quickly Mm -hmm. to know should should we continue should we get on this train should we walk by that person um that that is, I, I think that there's that, and also, I want everybody to win in whatever it is they want to do, and so when you're in my end, when you're in my space, or if I'm around you, I'm encouraging, I'm 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 encouraging you, yeah. and I realize that I can be that my encouragement can sometimes, maybe probably most times for people who are not ready to step into their greatness, can come off as critique or judgment, mm-hmm. and. Now I recognize, oh, they're shutting down. Yeah. They didn't ask you, Tawana. They didn't ask you for your Ooh, that's a whole word from Christine. That's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole word. I, I I'm still in process. I'm still, still in progress. Because if you see, because I see, I'm, I'm like, you oh, see, I see it. You know, all oh, you gotta do like, is boom, boom, boom. I can help you. Come on, it's easy. It seems hard to you, but I know how to do it. I want to ask you what time it was, though. I asked you what time. No, it was. but you can make a watch, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Because because I saw all the things that you have in your house. You've actually been making a watch. <laughs> you can have your own line. Yeah. 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 So, I love yeah. it. Yes. And I love that you're, it's that allowing, allowing it, allowing it to come through and allow yourself to use that gift. Because I know it can be scary in, in the beginning. I can, I can yes. relate to Stepping that. Stepping into it was, was hard. Yeah. And dimming my light and just pushing other people forward. And now that I'm no longer dimming my light and now that I'm stepping into it, the behaviors of those who I've known for many, many years, I've had my longest relationship, my longest friendship just crumbled where, where it's just like for many years, when I moved here to LA in 2005, we weren't talking then because I was changing because I was in that apartment. I didn't, I didn't know that then, but I was in that apartment. I was evolving. Mm-hmm. Something new was being, was being birthed. And so something happened in that, in that time where we weren't speaking. So when I had my going away party, she was not there. Mm-hmm. And then we reconciled here and then we tried to get back together. And then we had another stumbling block and I just chalked it up to, oh, you know, it's like being in, in a married couple. You go to therapy, you work it out or whatever. And then we had another bump and this is like 10 year spans or whatever. And then finally the last one happened when I turned 50 and, and then I saw something very clearly where it was like, you know, when, when in the movies with a line, the, the vignette just shines on you and everything goes dark. And I was like, oh my God, I don't, I don't know her at all. She's, she's different. Or yeah. maybe because I'm different, I, I can't do that anymore. Yeah. And so then I had to release it. Yeah, that's a hard, that's been one of the hardest, hardest things for me in this chapter of my life, I must say, from moving, leaving Atlanta, coming to LA this time, 
and relationships dissolving. Yeah. And nobody and, talks about that. Yeah. And, and at the, and because of, I'm deep, for those of you who don't know, I'm deep into personal development. I mean, people say, how yes. do you tell me how, how you really look and know? Well, I changed my mindset. Yeah. 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 But about, yeah. but no, no, that's, yeah. that's, that that's was really it. Like, I've always been a great actress. I'm sure you are too, but the, this, so because I do my work, I know everybody doesn't do their work or people are doing their work in it's different ways. But I, I remember before I moved here, there were people who lived here. It was like, oh yeah, when you call, when you get here, give me a call, you know, oh yeah, come, come see me. Right. And maybe when I visited, I visited and had lunch with people here and there. But when I moved here, mm-hmm. some of those people vanished. Yeah. And what I've noticed also is the distance, the more, the more visible I've become mm. through, through my work, through coaching, like, you know, me Tawana, like I'm not, I'm not dimming for no, I'm not dimming. Yes. I'm, I'm over here with this. First Richard, of all, uh, Mary and is not dimming for anybody. I have many Sagittarius in my life. I know any of them to even own a dimmer. <laughs> What sign are you? Facts. I'm a Gemini. I'm Paul, I'm right opposite. Oh, okay. You're very much okay. the same. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, but I just and I just had to. I would, I would find I would find myself texting people, "Happy birthday, girl!" Every year, "Happy birthday!" Yeah, or yeah, yeah. I'm the one reaching out. You want to meet for lunch? You want to meet for? Look, I'm from New York. I, I don't do this. Yeah, let's go on a hike. No. Yeah. No. No, yeah. I don't do fake appointments. No. Like, no. are we gonna meet or not? Yeah. I can take a no. Yeah, it's fine. And I, and I had to realize do an assessment. It was like, these people don't want you in their lives anymore. Yeah. If they did. You would not be chasing. And I don't chase. I attract. Yeah. So that was hard though. And I had to admit, God, that hurts my feelings. Of course. But then I had to understand like everyone is doing what they need to do for themselves. That's right. And it's not personal sometimes, but for the most part, because they're in whatever they're in, right. Maybe feeling, maybe feeling inadequate, may, whatever, whatever, the process. I don't know. The process. You don't know. It's not your business. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you're watching and have experienced that, you know, what I've, I've learned, I know you y'all didn't ask my advice, but <laughs> you gotta give people, the, people are showing you. They are, are showing sh- you. So yeah, for 40 years, it's, it's been there. It's like a sixth sense where you just start to see the dead person was there through all the vignettes. Oh, and when you have other friends be like, hey, watch your back. Mm. No, not that person. No, mm. no, no, no. But yeah. And it's, yeah. it's hard. It's hard to release relationships, um, especially I think for women, because we are, you know, socialized the way we are. Be a good friend. Always be there. Always be strong. Uh, you know, all the, the programming that we receive. And there mm. really is no um, conversation around releasing friends. There's, there's therapy for couples. Mm-hmm. but there's no therapy for friendships you know so maybe that's a book you need to get. <laughs> I got some stories and I it's yeah. and I've just had to learn I had to you know I actually have turned to like thinking about when I've heard Oprah speak at certain times and she'll say like just like how everybody's not on the is can't go on the full journey with you you know some people get off that's hard some people get off the train you know and and be like, okay, well, thank I thank God for the time we had and for what we brought to each other's lives. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's, that, it's that reason, season, or lifetime. Exactly. So when you think back to your 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 work, what job was it? What and I know you've done so much, but what job did you book that made you say, after you got done, I'm really good at this. Oh, that's a good question. Got to go deep in the thought thing. Um, uh, well, so I, I was a closeted singer. I, my mother has this high soprano. She was always singing Chaka Khan songs. Anybody, uh, not Nancy Wilson, but um, Nellie, Nellie Cole. She was always singing those songs. So my ear pulled onto that. I didn't know. And there was this one moment where I tried to sing in church and I was so nervous, my voice cracked. Um, and you know, the church, go on baby, sing the song. But no, I was like, no, I'm going back in the closet. That was scary. <laughs> there's, there's been all these moments 
And one friend, when I used to dance on MTV for, on the grind, and we would tape like, I don't know, 20 shows in one day, you know, it was just straight slave labor. And when we would drive from the Bronx to Manhattan, she would always sing. And she was like, you, you take the high part. And I'd be like, what, what? And so she would teach me, you do that, you do that part, I'm, I'm gonna take the low or whatever. And then I started realizing, oh, I can harmonize. Oh, I can sing whatever. But I was still very, very timid, very shy. Um, and then of course, Mariah came out and it's like, Tawana, you can hit that note. And I'd be like, <laughs> you know, whatever. But if you ask me to sing in front of people, no. Yeah. So that friend who was here was in Hair, the musical. And it was a great, great um, cast and performance. And a few of those, two of the guys from that performance wrote a musical. Like, I'm not really big on musicals. I like fame, rent, the movie. I was just like, oh my God, they're singing again. You know, so me and musicals don't really do well. So you I- You gotta see rent, you gotta see rent in person. The music, that's, I, what I, that's what I think. I yeah. agree. The movie was too much. When I see like little snippets of the actual Broadway thing, I'm like, oh, Ooh. I like this. I was one of those people who sat out for the lottery tickets in the front row, take it. Spitting on my face, like yeah, just yes, yeah. Amazing. Let me let me get all that spit. You would have been, you would have been head bobbing in that row. With I me. sure would have. Yes. So these two guys who are musical theater people, they wrote a play, and they said, "Hey, do you think Tawana would do a role in this play?" And so she was like, "Hey, you know, Trance and Tim. Let me give them a shout out. Trance and Tim asked if I would do a role, and I was like, "Yeah, but I'm not singing." And she's like, "No, no, no, no. It's there's some talking parts or whatever." I was like, "All right, we get to the table read." It's a bunch of us here. And now we got the scripts out and I'm reading my part or whatever. And it says, Leslie sings. I'm Leslie. So I look at my friend, she sit right next to me. So she just puts a, she knew the whole time. <laughs> Set up. And so I'm dripping sweat and I look over at Trance and Trance, Trance, Trance ain't here to play games with people, but he's very um, supportive. And he said, yeah, Tawana, you're going to sing. How, you can't be in a musical and you're not going to sing. I have a feeling you can sing. Felicia said you can sing. And I was like, He's like, don't worry, I'll work with you. So I'm singing in my little head voice. <laughs> He's like, no, you hit, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to bring it. <laughs> We're gonna meet. So once I started working with him and this big old belt came out that I didn't know, he's like, 20, you're not breathing. And I was like, oh, I thought it was bad when you can hear the singers breathing in the song. I, he's like, well, how are they supposed to get their breath? I was like, I don't know. I just, I just get tired of hearing them breathe. <laughs> so, but he taught me placements mm -hmm. and then we did this musical and I mean they had like 10 part harmony these dudes their musicality wow. is is wonderful but when we did that it was just a stage reading but that bar of excellence that's another thing that I'm very attracted to people who walk in excellence mm -hmm. high bar of excellence I'm attracted mm -hmm. to that yeah because that's how I operate. And now I know that we can both lift this thing together as opposed to the piano following me and taking me down the stairs. Right. But it was that musical that night when I realized I can actually sing. That's, that's a singing story, but um, acting, I'd have to really think about what was it? Maybe it'll come to me. But that no, was the first thing I, that came to But me. I love that story too, because it was something that you weren't totally comfortable sharing with the world. Mm -mm. My mother didn't know. Or even, in, right, or even admitting to yourself. Yeah. And then you ended up doing a whole musical. Yeah. It was, um, I think it was like one night only. We put in a lot of work. One night only. Exactly. It was just because. I do like that musical. Yeah. Um, the original. Um, shade, no shade. So. Um, <laughs> you gonna move on. <laughs> then when I joined. The choir, so I belong, I'm a, I'm a first soprano at the um, Agape International Choir. And I'm just in the choir, so I could be a part of the choir. I'm not interested in solos. People are up here vying for solos. I'm not, I don't want no part of it. I just want to bring joy mm -hmm. through, my, through, through this unified voice. And uh, Ricky Byers Beckwith, actually, I think it was Marianne Lewis, who's the, who is the current director. She's like, Tawana, come up here and see if you can sing this song. What? So I'm kind of singing it. All these people, like 200 people in the choir, drenched in sweat. And I'm singing, she's like, yeah, you, you're gonna sing that. So, so then now we got to rehearse it with Ricky. And Ricky is someone who she has no filter. Her truth is her truth. You better get into it or right. leave. She, as she would say, make peace with me. Things would be easier for you. <laughs> I'm gonna have to borrow that. Yeah, and so 
the Sunday that I had to sing that song, something came out of me that I've never heard before. This voice, this high note. And, and I, you got took over. I was blacked out up there. And, and when you look, when I looked at the video, you see me trans, transcend, my eyes are closed. And then when it's over, I start shaking my hand that had the mic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, what is that? Gripping it's, it too hard? I don't know what it was. And this guy who watched it, he's like, you know, I rewatched it. Why did you shake your hand? And I said, I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah. That's the gift. That yeah. is the gift. I feel, I know I've seen you sing. I know I've seen you sing probably at, I know at a service. It's been a minute, mm -hmm. been a minute, but I love that you tapped into that. I remember I was in fifth grade. I shared this story with, and I was talking to someone else on this series. And for me, it was fifth grade. I had one line in a play. And, and that's what I just practiced it at home. My mother was like, oh, you can sing. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Do I know her? Mm -hmm. You didn't know her. Right. <laughs> I love that. Let's transition. I have a couple of questions before we wrap. Okay. Um, I want to talk a bit about the ebbs and flows of this industry. And as, mm -hmm. as all, you all have been watching and listening, you hear this, this wasn't just Tawana was like, yeah. And then I decided, and then I just was a yeah. celebrity, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Sometimes I think people think that, you know, I coach a lot of people. I know you mentor people and people can, and I'm never one to say this never, I never say never anything anomalies, is anomalies. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm the first one to say that, but I also like to just be transparent about the journey for a lot of people. So how have you dealt with, and when we talk ebbs and flows, guys, I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about moments where you're working a lot and then it's slow for a bit. And I'm also talking about when money's tight. And I'm also talking about when you're the, it's between you and one other person and you're so close to this juicy opportunity and it goes to someone else. Like, how do you balance your mental state, your mental health and deal with the roller coaster that is our career? Yeah, all of those things you've mentioned, everything that I think any artist, no matter what medium we're working in, experiences. Um, it, it took me a while to learn this, but the only thing I can do, and this just happened yesterday, is sit in the feelings. That's the only thing I can do. Um, I used to joke, but it's really not a joke, that when people move to LA, they choose one of the polars. One side, there's drugs, alcohol, anesthetizing their emotions. The other one is spirituality, stepping into the feelings, allowing God to use us. Um, and so I went that route. Yeah, I remember there was one point where I was working four part-time jobs that still did not allow me to earn what I'm used to earning, like when I was work working in New York. It still wasn't enough for me to live. And I was doing this because actors need to have availability. Mm -hmm. So I'm working, killing myself, working all these jobs, trying to just pay my rent and eat. Meanwhile, my, my, the cloud around me had dimmed. It was like, it's like when, the, when, when the sun is shining, but there's that haze. So my overcast, I had this overcast. that's not even allowing me to shine. And I remember one of the jobs was um, I was, I was, um, what do you call it? Doing uh, inventory for American greetings, which I would go to like Toys R Us and Rite Aid and I would stack their whole American greetings cards. It took a lot of time. I actually liked it because I could be by myself, but, um, but the pay wasn't well. And then another job where I was working for Club Monaco and I was doing their overnight store moves, floor moves. And that job would start at nine o'clock at night and go to 5 a.m. And we would do it two nights back to back. And I, my turnover time just would take me a whole week. So it would take me out of my career pursuit for a whole week. Mm -hmm. And so there was, I think I did it for about three months and I'm on top of a ladder. And when I do stuff, I really, I, I do it. So I'm folding my sweaters and getting everything aligned and just meticulous. And I'm at the top of the ladder and it's hot and it's probably like 12 a.m. And I'm already getting tired. I'm like, oh my God, we got four more hours. And I'm listening to, oh my God, I was listening to some motivational speaker. I can't remember what it was. And then through that, I heard the voice of God say, do you think this is all that I have for you? Mm. And, I, and I had a sweater in my hand and I looked around. I was like, do you really think 
that this is what I have for you. I think the job was paying $10 an hour, like really low bald. Do you really think that this is what I have for you? And I said, no. They said, okay, so go quit the job. I got down off the, <laughs> the ladder, went to the guy. I was like, hey, so this is gonna be my last day. And he's like, no, you're so great. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. You could use me, but no, this is my last day. Mm -hmm. And going back to that Bergdorf Goodman, I started to learn how to quit jobs very easily. Anthony <laughs> said that to me. He's like, Tawana, everybody can't quit a job like you. I was like, listen, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> they don't respect me, the pay is not whatever, I'm tired. So there was that. But the main thing that I have to do is I have to sit in the feelings. And there are times I remember because I'm a heavy believer in um, astrology and Mercury in retrograde. And because Mercury is my ruling planet, um, it really affects me. It impacts me. And so I just go very slow. And so there was one year where it was, I was just like, everything was just, I just felt bombarded and heavy and nothing was working out. And I said, you know what? Called my agents. I booked out for the full duration of Mercury retrograde. And I sat here. And I watched, I don't know, was it like 10 seasons of Project One Way? <laughs> However many seasons I watched every, I, I'd get up in the morning, shower, meditate, eat, whatever, watch Project Runway. And here's what, because because God is amazing. You watching all those, those episodes, what I learned is the people who come in with a strong vision are usually in the bottom three. Mm -hmm. The people who start to self-doubt themselves, the next challenge they go home. It's the people who really believe in themselves and, and, and also stay in their lane, meaning they know what their vision is. They know their design, what they do. The people who start to be like, oh, well, that one last time, so maybe I'll make a dress like that, they go home. <laughs> so this was God's way of infusing in me during this time, these principles of mm -hmm. know your vision, stay on track. Don't try to see what your friend is doing. It's like, oh, she's booking a lot. Well, let me start um, wearing cougar dress, you know, whatever. Let me start wearing that red, whatever the case may be. And then also uh, stay in the course. Yeah. So, so in that short time, so, so because of that, it is very easy for me to take a break. If it starts to feel like a burden, if I start feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I love Oprah says, um, ask for guidance. What is the next best step, the next right thing I should be doing? Mm -hmm. And then sit back and then al allow those downloads to happen. And I swear to you, if you're open, if you're listening to it, your, your intuition is, is stronger than anything I can ever um, recommend. But that also requires an awareness. It requires an awareness. And an abundant mindset because the fear that can come up for some yeah. For some actors, what will I miss if? So even though you're feeling all this and it feels like I need a break or I need to step away, there's that yeah. there can easily be that feeling of but what will I miss or will I get dropped? Like all the what ifs yeah. that really are just lack mentality. So yes, yes. there's a there's another side to that. Also, yes, we do have to because I used to be that. I used to be on the other side of that and I had to come to cultivate. I remember when I made the declaration that from here on out, I'm tapping into my intuition and I'm making decisions based on that. Now, there are moments where the whisper is, is so low. Why didn't, I was like, I, I don't know what that was. And I still go to, I was like, oh damn, I just heard the whisper. Mm -hmm. And so now my new mantra is like, listen to the whispers. Got to listen to the whispers. They always know. That's the, that's because, because God knows that I've cultivated and honed my listening. So he doesn't have to like come through anything. He could just be like, Hey, yeah, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. the other day, I went to pick up three plates out of the dish drainer. And as soon as I grabbed them, it's like, Nope, just take one. And as soon as I picked it up, all three of them fell and broke. <laughs> Listen like to the whispers. That. Hey, don't, don't pick, don't do that. Yeah. But it takes time. It is cultivation and practice. Yeah, and it's a and it's a trust that that's the right voice too, and you're not gonna know to you. Discernment of knowing, yeah, which voice it is. Yep. Yes. <laughs> that and it just takes practice and rep, just that's that repetition. Yeah, repetition. Yeah. That voice, there's always a voice there. Oh, that's so mm -hmm. good. Yeah, sitting in, and that's been um. You said it very eloquently, but that's been the 
the theme for a lot of the artists I've been talking to in this series about everyone has said it different, but at some point you have to sit in it. You have to feel it. Like to pretend that you don't feel disappointed it prolongs, is, is yeah. not true. Yeah. Because and we also are an industry. Pain. Right. Because we're in an industry where people say, just brush it off, you know, onto the next, you know, nope. solid, right. Nope. And it's like, yeah, but hold yeah. on. Like, right. and because sometimes you get a, you get a release or a pen is released or, you, or something doesn't pan out, but yeah. before you can even fully sit in it, there's another opportunity that's coming through the door. And yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, oh, but I do okay. Okay. Let me, okay. Now I'm on this. And so, yeah. you know, I talked about this on an older podcast about grieving mm-hmm. and not just in the sense of, of, a, of a loved one, but grieving, grieving work that we've completed, you know, as actors, we, we show up on a set or on a Broadway show or whatever, and we have to bond. We have to bond. We must bond immediately, as quick as possible, yeah. so that these performances feel real and grounded, and we really feel connected and not like strangers. And then it's ripped apart. The job is over, and it's done. Gone. Yeah. And it happens over and over and over. over. And then right. the roles that you were called back for, pinned for, about to test for, so close. Like there's all this grieving. And for me, yeah. acting is very spirituality, the people I step into. And it's like, yeah, you gotta give yourself the space and the time to, and it's okay. And it's okay. Listen, okay. everyone may not understand it, especially if you're not in the industry. Mm-hmm. Like, but allowing ourselves, I, it's just how you said it, just allowing yourself to feel yes. and, and to honor it. And it doesn't make us weak or whatever. We're still, no. you know, we're going to dust ourselves off. But can I get a second though? Can yeah. I get- and sometimes it's fleeting. Sometimes it'll move really quickly just by acknowledging it. Right. Sometimes it takes a couple of months. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. So let's honor it. I love that. Yeah. As we wrap, I want you to, you know, kind of, it's a good segue. I want you to, holding your mind's eye for a second, Mm -hmm. the actor, artist at home who's been seasoned, been doing this for a long time, maybe 15 plus years, but they've hit a moment where it's just a lull and it's quiet and they're second guessing everything. And then I want you to think about the brand as what I would call a brand newbie and someone brand new, drive, have the drive, but they just feel like they keep hitting walls and can't get that first breakthrough. Both of them are thinking, maybe I should, who am I kidding? Maybe I should just throw in the towel. Maybe I'm delusional. What word of advice could you give them? I'm going through this right now as a veteran actor. And fortunately, the pandemic allowed so many of us to sit down and look at what's working, what's not working, and what are we willing to release. Um, Jokingly, I've quit acting probably 700 times in my lifetime, in in my 20 years, but I never quit, right? It's just taking that that time away. But what I've learned as of late, especially now that we are in this space of the Issa Rays, of the Quinta Brunsons, of the Michaela Coles, who are creating their own narrative because the industry wouldn't give them the access in the way they deserved by something that's three-dimensional perform uh, uh, characters or what have you. I I would say find other avenues of creativity that offer immediate rewards Mm. because acting takes a long time to cultivate and the rewards, there's more rejection than there are rewards but when the rewards come, they do help to compensate for a lot of the rejection, but it takes a long time. So what are those other things? I, we've always been taught, oh, don't have a plan B. I'm not talking about a plan B. I'm talking about creatives. We, an actor can do many things. And at one point we used to write the stuff, perform the stuff, market the stuff, go get the venue. We wore all the hats and somewhere along the line, all of, we were convinced that it was better to have middlemen to take those positions on and get 10% for it. Mm -hmm. So find other avenues of creativity. And so for me, it became improv, um, learning improv and being able to get on stage and create a story right there on a spot out of a suggestion, bomb, 
<laughs> sometimes have a, a great cohesive story, sometimes have laughter, but I'm having fun. And that was rewarding. Um, now for me, and, and they always say this, diversify your portfolio, right? And so we always equate that with finance, but really it's for everything in your life, maybe not dating, or maybe not when you're married, <laughs> you want you want to be with one person. But creativity has to diversify. You have to allow yourself. Stuart K. Robinson, who was my first um, commercial teacher when I moved to LA, he said this in his podcast, I think it's called Hollywood Brass Tax. He said that his agent or manager, he they have to know that he does all these things. He's not going to allow them to put him in the box. He composes music. He, he coaches people. He does all the, he writes. And he's like, sometimes I only feel like writing and I don't want to do the other stuff. So I need to have a manager or representation that understands I'm not doing writing right now, or I'm not doing music right now. Mm -hmm. My creativity is coming through writing and you have to allow me that space to do that. And that's, it's also, and I keep bringing this up, Divine guidance is always bringing you to the avenues where you're going to reap the most rewards. And sometimes that, that narrow focus on acting, it's that whole thing when you hold the hose too tight, the water can't flow. Yeah, right. So you've got to release that and go focus on something else to let this open up and become more abundant. It always happens. It mm -hmm. always happens. It, you may not have experienced this, but it always happens. Um, I would just say finding creative outlets that give you faster, immediate rewards so that acting is not so important. And again, when it starts to feel like it's too much, just take a break and yeah. do nothing. I promise you something is being birthed in that time of your stillness. Something is coming through and you have to allow the space for the unfolding to happen. And it hits you and it's like, oh my gosh. And by taking that narrow focus off of that and coming over here to do something else, then when you come here, you see it differently. Yeah. And then there's other avenues that were right in front of you. It's like when you, you're you looking for something on a counter and you didn't see it and you come back and it's like, that was not there. Yeah, but it was. <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> right. Right. No. And you live by yourself. So, <laughs> you know, go get a new vision. Allow yourself to remove yourself from the thing that's not flourishing right now. Go get a new vision and then revisit it. But allow yourself to be led by whatever you call divine. Mm -hmm. You know, I know there's people who don't believe in, you know, and that is, that is their pr pr uh, prerogative. But there's something that you believe in. Mm -hmm. And so let that pull you. Yeah. And, you know, that's beautiful. And I would also add... I think sometimes there's a secret wish that it will, this industry just will stay steady. Oh yeah, no. And it's not built it's that way. It's always in transit. Yes. <laughs> it's just not built that way. No. And the more, like, just understand that. Yeah. And I think when you understand, like when you, it's not gonna, you may, it, it may feel this way right now. Yeah. But it's like being on a boat, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> What's that wise, that wise head shake? Oh yeah. It, I just had this this vision of being on the on on the subway platform on the local side. And the and the train comes, you're expecting it to stop because it's the local side, but no, it's express. It just kept going. Right. <laughs> What's happening? It got rerouted. It was an express train, but mm -hmm. it they just moved it over here. But your train is coming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. I love that. <laughs> That's so good. You know, honestly, in, in, when I had some slow moments, it was, that was how my book got written. Yeah. It was like, I was yeah. like, okay. I said, okay, God, what's this time for? Because clearly it's not for auditioning. No. Uh, yeah. And I, and I was like, and I, and I've learned over the years to use silence. Cause like, as you know, I'm busy. I stay busy. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what is this? And I just went in like, and I was, I kept putting that book off. I kept putting my book off. Yeah. And then I said, well, I got time. And I'm just, I've committed to waking up early every day. I was like, and then yeah. three months later it was done. It was done. And then and the so joy I, of completion on a book. Yeah. Yeah. That came from you. Yeah. That's far more rewarding than, than somebody saying here, read these lines. Yeah. I love how you said, find something that is, gives you more of an immediate reward. 
-hmm. that really is resonating with me and is a Mm -hmm. that's really good because as we all know too like we 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 hope to get the audition right okay we get the audition great hope to get the role okay okay we get the role hope to okay i filmed it great hope i don't get cut out like it's like it's all the The things constant perpetual cycle of (laughs) mental noise right right so if we don't find a way to bring the peace for ourselves yeah you know i even love watching your instagram sometimes you do like these mini oh, movies you. and i'm just it's just that's like my little, little, i my love little. it though thank you i mean i truly enjoy it. it's so creative and i'm like mm-hmm. it's like so when you're saying more of an immediate like i know that reward i have when i do a fierce tiktok like oh that tiktok banging can't yeah. wait yeah oh, right like, you said watch your own thing oh that is good girl that is good <laughs> okay but listen, you know, because how many times yes. are we doing amazing work and we never get feedback, we never hear anything else. So yeah. right. feeding our own creativity because it's just part of us. Like yeah. I think I was I was talking to Chelsea Crisp yesterday, an actress, and and we were talking about like just you can decide to take this to take a break, but like even if you stop, raise kids or do whatever, doesn't mean yeah. if you, you can still be creative no matter what you do and no matter what life. you do or where you are in the world. Exactly. I remember when Crystal was pregnant with her baby. And, and feeling like everything was happening around her. And I'm like, you're a whole mother right now. Right. Yeah. And now her career is awesome. Yes. It's absolutely. Okay. It and absolutely. if I could just inject this one last thing. Yes. My, sorry, I had to close my email. It was making noise. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> please, please, please stop comparing yourself to your friends. Mm. Their success, you, you have, we have no idea what they've done to get where they are, just like they have no idea what you've done to get where you are. But the main thing is that everybody's like this, right? So comparing is poison for your mindset because it just makes you think that you're not worthy or all the things that you could tell yourself. Mm -hmm. Celebrate your friends instead. Jim Carrey spoke on a Hollywood Reporter round table. Sasha Baron Cohen was at the table. And Jim Carrey made this admission right there. And he said, when Sasha Baron Cohen came on the scene, he said he was terrified because Jim Carrey has been the only person who does what he does for years. And then here comes Sasha Baron Cohen who does the same thing and well. And so, and Jim Carrey said he had two decisions. He had to either embrace him or he would always resent him. And the resentment would kill his creativity. So he chose to embrace Sasha and he invited him to come to his house. And so, and so Sasha's just sitting there like, what? Like you, you to me are a God, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I just thought that was so phenomenal and profound to recognize you have two decisions to make right then and there. And one will kill your career and the mm-hmm. other one will elevate the both of you. Ooh, I love that. I gotta Ooh. find that. Yeah. That's, Cause it is a choice at that point. It's a choice. Ooh. Yes. Y'all, you see why I got Tawana on here? <laughs> you see why? <laughs> Tawana, this has been a gift. Man, I, like I said, so I'm much to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing all of these gems. If you mm-hmm. miss any part of the Booking Magnet Magic series, do yourself a favor and catch up. Uh, all these conversations have just been divine and I such can't a wait to see them. Because I love yeah. me, I love me some words of wisdom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. So I, that's like, you know, it's like, I love being getting to interview people because yeah. you, you just learn and I love hearing people's stories. Mm-hmm. So remember, you have a gift that the world needs to see. So don't rob us and don't rob yourself of sharing that gift. Okay. Mm-hmm. And remember, just like we talked about today, each and every one of us has something that is magical and magnetic about us. So just keep getting to know yourself. Keep getting, I keep, I can't, I can't I can, my brain keeps thinking of Tawana in this apartment. I just yeah. see you here. You like, too. It was cute. You know? Yeah. you know, but getting to know yourself. And I know that can yeah. be that can be scary because you don't know you don't know what's gonna come up. But I promise you it'll it'll serve you. So thank you so much, Tawana. I will see you all at the next interview that we do. Thank you so much for watching. Yes. Bye. Bye everyone.